At Two, Babe, by Mark Lehner. Preface. June 6, 1993, Hoboken. Dear Peter Gazzardi, as you know, I am not your average author. I dress like an off-duty cop, leather blazer, silk turtleneck, tight, sharply creased slacks, Italian loafers, pinky ring. I drive a candy apple red Jaguar with a loaded 9mm semi-automatic pistol in the glove compartment. When I walk into a party, I'm like this. My head is bobbing to music that only exists in my mind. For our seventh anniversary, I gave my wife, Arlene Portada, a rotating diamond impregnated drill bit the kind that West German and Soviet geologists use in their deep drilling programs, programs that produce ultra-deep holes with depths of up to 15 kilometers. But hey, that's just the kind of guy I am. Dynamic. Robust. No nonsense. A steak and chops man. Double scotch rocks. A man who makes things happen. Big, hairy hands. A powerful fist that comes down on a conference table with peremptory authority. Then there's stunning Arlene Portada. Mystic. Sensualist. Why is she covered with centipede stings? If you spent all day on a sun-baked prairie wearing a sizzling orange mini-dress supervising a platoon of beefy workmen as they paint immense grain silos vibrant yellow and fuchsia, you'd be covered with centipede stings, too. My whole life has been one long, ultra-violent, hyperkinetic nightmare. But yes, I am an author. And a dog trainer. Peter, I taught my puppy Carmella to drink scalding hot black coffee out of her bowl on the floor. The other day, I imagined that it was the year 2187. A dozen people were gathered at the gravesite of porn star John Holmes to commemorate the 200th anniversary of his death. Well, Peter, I want to be remembered by more people than that. I don't know. Perhaps that's why I write. The unwashed armpits of the most beautiful women in the world. A urinal with chunks of fresh watermelon in it. A retarded guy whining, Eddie, Eddie, get me an awful teen. Almost anything inspires me. Immediately after finishing My Cousin, My Gastroenterologist, I outlined a new book about people with trichotillomania, people who compulsively pull out their hair. There are two million to four million Americans who have trichotillomania. That's a lot of books. That's a lot of hair, too. I abandoned that idea, though. That's not the kind of book that... Harmony wants from a Mark Laner, right? Well, I'm confident that after perusing the following excerpts, you'll agree that the novel I hereby propose is indeed the kind of book that Harmony wants from a Mark Laner. Et tu, babe. A master jam of relentless humor and indeterminate trajectories teeming with creatures and the burlesque of their virulent lives, will undoubtedly be, page by page and line by line, the most entertaining book that Harmony has ever published. Excerpts from Et Tu, Babe. 
the four-foot hermaphroditic organism from a distant solar system twitched in my arms as I soul-kissed it. The laboratory director would have killed me if he'd known that I'd snuck into the galactic life-form chamber with a bottle of wine, a cassette player, and an eclectic selection of tapes, Felix Mendelssohn, Steppenwolf, Barbara Mandrell, for a clandestine tryst with the cylindrical being whom the lab technicians had christened Kitty LaFontaine. I pipetted a few drops of 1982 Napa Valley Zinfandel into its alimentary aperture. Its synesthetic sensory apparatus was distributed evenly across the entirety of its shiny outer sheath, so it could see, hear, smell, touch, precognize from any point on its body. To say that holding Kitty LaFontaine in my arms was like nestling a large holiday beef log from Hickory Farms would certainly not convey the spine-tingling, xenophilic, libidinous awe I felt. But it would accurately convey the shape, mass, and weight of this fascinating creature who would irrevocably change all our lives that summer. Dear Science Editor of the Times, Frequently the counterman at a sandwich shop will ask, Do you want everything on it? Well, what if you had a sandwich with literally everything on it? In other words, how large a sandwich roll would you need to accommodate all matter in the universe? And as a corollary, imagine an inconceivably immense being capable of eating this almost infinitely capacious submarine sandwich. If this colossal creature began eating at the instant of the Big Bang, by what century would he be able to consume digest, metabolize, and excrete the hypothetical hoagie. And would not this meal, by its very nature, exhaust time itself? Dear editors at Swank, Your article on the sensitive areolas of large-breasted women was excellent. Also, thanks for the recipe for Paella Valenciana that you published in the October Swank. I'm no gourmet chef, but I made the dish for my girlfriend, and after dinner, she couldn't keep her prosthetic hands off my veiny nine-inch chorizo. I had once intended to write an entire novel while having to urinate very badly. I wanted to see how that need affected the style and tempo of my work. I had found, for instance, that when I'm writing about a character who's in a Ph.D. program and I don't have to urinate badly, I'll have him do a regular three- or four-year program. But if I'm writing a novel and I have to urinate very, very badly, then I'll push the character through an accelerated Ph.D. program in perhaps only two years, maybe even a year, in 1987, I enrolled in a 12-step program for people who pistol-whip their tailors. First, I had to admit to myself that pistol-whipping my tailor was in fact a problem. Today, I take life one day at a time. Each day that passes without my having pistol-whipped my tailor is a victory. A solid step toward recovery. Do you believe in God? Yes, sir. Do you believe in an anthropomorphic, vengeful, capricious God who can look down on one man and give him fabulous riches and look down on another and say, your history, and give him a cerebral hemorrhage? Yes, sir. You may take the stand. What is your full name? I am General Ramon 
Umberto Realdo Rosa Cordoba Lopez. General Lopez, you are descended from a very illustrious family, is that not true? Yes, sir. My great, 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 great grandfather was a nobleman in Spain in the 15th century, and it was he who first discovered that the atomized saliva of hunchbacks enhances the growth of flowers. He, in fact, retained a large staff of hunchbacks to sneeze on his tulips. General, are those your real nails? Sir? Are those your real fingernails? Yes, sir. General, you are a liar! Objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, I can see, defense counsel can see, and the ladies and gentlemen of the jury can see that the general is wearing Lee's press-on nails. Objection overruled. Continue. General, under direct examination, you were asked to describe events that took place on the morning of April 26, 1987. You testified, and I quote, I was a short, thick-set man with a fleshy, brutal face. I felt bad. I had been drinking heavily the previous night, and the heat bothered me. My wife was sleeping. Wake up, stupid, I snarled. I shook her, and I kissed her savagely. You stink, she sneered. Your breath smells like the steam that rises off fresh vomit. I jabbed a syringe full of methamphetamine into her ass, which was covered with boils the size of potato pancakes. Is that still an accurate account to the best of your knowledge? Yes, sir. General, it strikes me as exceedingly odd that asked to describe a particular morning on a particular day, you would say I was a short, thick-set man with a fleshy, brutal face. Are we to understand by this that you were a short, thick-set man with a fleshy, brutal face only on April 26, 1987? Objection, Your Honor. This kind of semantic nitpicking is an obvious form of harassment. The district attorney knows full well that the general was a short, thick-set man with a fleshy, brutal face prior to April 26, 1987, that he was a short, thick-set man with a fleshy, brutal face during April 26, 1987, and that he continues to be a short, thick-set man with a fleshy, brutal face subsequent to April 26, 1987. Sustained. General, that afternoon... Did you receive a call at the office from your wife? Yes, sir. What did she say? She said that she thought she'd been on her liquid formula diet long enough, that she was so light that the static electricity from the television set was pulling her across the floor toward the screen. And she called one more time later that afternoon. Yes, sir. And what did she say? She said that she didn't have much time to talk, that she was tied to the railroad tracks, and the bullet train was coming. And that was the last time you ever spoke to her? Yes, sir. General, one final question. Do you have any tattoos? Yes, sir. On what part of your body and of what? I have E equals NHF, Max Planck's formula for the energy and radiation, tattooed on my penile glands. General, you are a pathological liar. Objection. Overruled. General, I'd like you to look at your penile glands and read to the court what's tattooed on it. It says D equals 16 T squared. Not E equals NHF. No, sir. And what's the significance of D equals 16 T squared? It's Galileo's formula for the distance an object falls from its starting point as time elapses from the instant it's dropped. Your Honor, 
I have no further questions. General Lopez, you may step down. The giant awoke, got high on drugs, and then went into town to forage for human flesh breakfast. He stopped at an intersection where his eye was caught by the puffy, orange dayglow parka of a postmenopausal crossing guard. He knelt down and plucked up the screaming crossing guard in his fingers and dropped her into a gunny sack slung across his back. He surveyed the town until he discerned the bright orange regalia of another prey whom he captured and then on to the next intersection and then to the next and the next and the next until his gunny sack was filled with squirming crossing guards. He returned home and lay the gunny sack on the counter. He urinated, and then he put some music on the stereo. It was a kind of music I'd never heard before, a single, high-pitched, oscillating tone. The giant peeled the crossing guards. After his breakfast, the floor was littered with puffy, orange dayglow parkas. Why crossing guards? Japanese scientists speculate that their conspicuous puffy orange dayglow parkas make them particularly attractive prey. Why postmenopausal women? Japanese scientists point to reduced estrogen levels. They think that estrogen is bitter to the tongue of the giant and that he simply finds the low-estrogen women tastier. But there's an even more intriguing explanation. Estrogen deficiencies in postmenopausal women cause osteoporosis, which is characterized by brittle bones. In other words, postmenopausal women are crunchier. Well, Peter... How does that sound to you? I'm ready for it, babe. I'm massaging IQ-enhancing balm into my temples, and I'm loading up on Winstrol, the steroid that got sprinter Ben Johnson disqualified from the uh, 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul. It's a 40-minute hydrofoil ride from Hong Kong to Macau. Look out toward the horizon. There's Big Arlene rising up out of the water. Her white gown is fluttering violently in the wind. Her lace veil is congested with sea spume. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she just absolutely beautiful? Oh, one last question, Peter. My agent has a supernumerary nipple below and slightly medial to her right breast. The nipple produces approximately one watt of heat, about the same as that given off by a miniature Christmas tree bulb. Is this a standard energy output? Yours very truly, Mark Lehner. To Michael Peach, the monster maker. When I was eight, I was sent to live on the melon farm of an uncle, a sixth-grade dropout who attributed his IQ of 70 to sniffing gasoline and glue from the age of five, and whose manner of compulsively clawing at the skin behind his neck was a characteristic sign of amphetamine toxicity. One morning... He served me a cereal that consisted of sweetened corn puffs and marshmallow hook-nosed bearded Jews. I asked him never to serve that cereal to me again. The next morning, he set a heaping bowl of the same cereal on my placemat. I killed him with a 12-gauge shotgun blast before lunch. That night, I buried him in the cyclone cellar. I stole his pickup truck and drove out to a huge diesel-run electric turbine plant near the outskirts of the city, and I had my first sexual experience. 
Afterward, I lit a cigarette and looked up into the sky. There was God, wearing a pink polo shirt, khaki pants, and brown topsiders with no socks, his blonde hair blowing in the powerful wind of charged particles and intense ultraviolet radiation from the galactic center. I hated him, and he hated me. I have spent the majority of my 36 years in orphanages, reformatories, prisons, and mental institutions. I had four oboe teachers, and each one fell into an irrigation sluice and drowned. I tried explaining to my social workers that I hated double-read mouthpieces. I pleaded with them not to make me take lessons on any instrument in the oboe family, which also includes the English horn, the bassoon, and the double bassoon. But nobody listened. I hated the other children especially the ones whose parents could afford to provide proper orthodontic care. I had to gnaw constantly. My incisors grew four to five inches a year. If I'd stopped gnawing, my lower incisors would have eventually grown until they pushed up into my brain, killing me. Over the years, I was treated for a slew of psychiatric and behavioral problems. Dyslexia, depression excessive anxiety, obsessive-compulsive disorder, alcoholism, illicit drug abuse, obesity, eating disorders, exhibitionism, persistent, aggressive, and violent behavior, and hyperactivity combined with severe attention deficits. Yet, there was a voice within me that said, Someday, you will be considered the most intense and in a certain sense, the most significant young prose writer in America. And I listened. Today, I live in a lemon-yellow stucco mansion with sweeping views of the bay. Each morning, I nibble iced raw turtle eggs and chocolate-dipped strawberries in a garden ablaze with hibiscus and bougainvillea. Far cry from the anti-Semitic breakfast cereal forced upon me by my half-witted uncle on his squalid melon farm. My advice to the young people of today? I'm tempted to say, surround yourself with flunkies and yes-men and have naked slaves perfumed with musk fan you with plastic fronds as you write. Because that's what's worked for me. But what does history teach us? The 83rd president of the United States, Halix Valgus, had no mouth or gastrointestinal tract. How did this Christian scientist, who refused intravenous nourishment, survive? Only during the autopsy following President Valgus' assassination were scientists given the opportunity to solve this riddle. After painstaking dissection and analysis, pathologists found that Valgus was nourished from within by symbiotic bacteria. Their research revealed that the tissue of his trophosome, a large body structure which comprised half of Valgus's torso and which Valgus kept concealed beneath his ubiquitous spandex unitard, was composed of closely packed bacteria, over 100 billion per ounce of tissue. They found that his blood, deep red from a rich supply of hemoglobin, absorbed oxygen, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide from the polluted atmosphere and transported it to the trophosome. Thus ensured a rich supply of chemical resources, the bacteria living inside valgus produced carbohydrates and proteins, which valgus then metabolized. Halix valgus, the 83rd president of the United States the first occupant of the Oval Office to depend on symbiotic chemoautotrophic bacteria living within him. His long and detailed memoirs provide a unique picture of the personalities and politics of his times. Be petulant, narcissistic, and charismatic. That's what President Valgus would have exhorted today's young men and women 
had not a hit squad of gnat-sized robots filed stealthily into his ear and mined his brain with plastic explosive. And love. Love with extreme lucidity and barbaric ferocity. One of my foster mothers couldn't wait to shove me onto the school bus each morning so that she could get inside, doff her frowsy terry cloth robe and greasy house dress, squeeze into her edible lingerie, and await the arrival of the electrician, plumber, UPS delivery man, cable TV installer, exterminator, whichever beefy workman was fortunate enough to ring the doorbell first. That's not what I mean by love. When I use the word love, I'm thinking about the witty, urbane, wasp-waisted Arlene Portada. They were the heady, idealistic days of the early Valgus administration. Congress had just officially designated Bernard Herrmann's shrieking score for strings composed for the shower murder scene in Psycho as the national anthem. The look that year was post coital Tousled hair, runny mascara, smeared lipstick. Scientists working on the Human Genome Initiative announced identification of the specific gene that not only predisposes a person to take dancing lessons, but that actually determines his or her dance predilection, ballet, jazz, tap, or ballroom. It had been an exceptionally rainy spring, and indeed on the day we met, the sun was out for the first time in weeks. I was climbing trees that afternoon, and Arlene happened to be below, stalking live subjects for a research project she was doing as part of her MSW program at Fordham University. She shot me with air rifle darts full of tranquilizer. I lost muscle control gradually, one hand missing its grip, then the other, and fell into a net Arlene held outspread below. She carried me tenderly back to the lab for processing and measurements. Total length, arm length, chest diameter, testicle length and width. Look at the lunch pack on this guy she said, appreciating my scrotum. I hadn't really been planning to get involved, but how could I resist the subtle, sophisticated blandishments of this young and beautiful psychotherapist? Winning your place in the hierarchy is a basic part of primate life, and each day is a savage, pitiless battle for dominance. So don't expect everyone to like you. Today, I am the most intense, and in a certain sense, the most significant young prose writer in America. And I have the body of a grotesquely swollen steroid freak. Yet, I have many enemies. And these enemies will hurt me, unless I hurt them first. Ergo, the punji sticks and claymore mines that riddle the ground surrounding my headquarters. Ergo, my phalanx of bodyguards, seven formerly frail, arthritic, nonagenarian widows with heart disease selected from a nearby nursing home. Arlene and I took them in, treated them as members of our own family, administered large doses of synthetic human growth hormone and testosterone to each woman, and replaced her atrophied musculature with powerful artificial muscles made out of polymer gels that contract when electricity is applied and expand when the current is turned off. Do you want to see carnage unparalleled in the annals of internecine strife? Try laying a finger on me, Arlene, my dog Carmella, or one of my fans. I had a friend from my high school wrestling team named Jorge. After graduation, and for the entirety of his adult life, Jorge worked on a huge ant farm in southern New Jersey. Every morning, Jorge would get into his car and drive to the ant farm. But one morning, Jorge got into his car and he didn't drive to the ant farm. 
he selected suicide-exalting heavy metal music from among the cassettes in his glove compartment. And he turned the volume up full blast. And he headed north on the New Jersey turnpike. After traveling for some 90 minutes and having reached an area within a mile's proximity of Newark Airport, he exited the highway and pulled into a desolate industrial dump. He got out of the car, opened the trunk, and removed a shoulder-held Stinger anti-aircraft missile launcher. And he proceeded to blow a Federal Express jet en route from Chicago out of the sky as it made its final descent. Miraculously, the crew was able to eject from the plummeting aircraft and parachute to safety, but the plane's entire cargo of overnight letters and parcels was destroyed. I visited Jorge on death row. How could you do it? I asked. Every day of my life, I went into that goddamn ant farm. Every single day. And every single day, it was the same goddamn routine. They'd feed me steak or chopped meat, which I'd digest, and then they'd force me to regurgitate to feed the queen and her larva. Day after day after day, year after year. I just couldn't take it anymore. I just couldn't. He collapsed onto the floor. I knelt down to help him, but he waved me away. There's nothing you can do. I've taken a massive dose of bromodialone, a powerful anticoagulant. In a minute, I'm going to die of internal hemorrhaging. But please... There's one thing I want to tell the young people of today. If you... He began to lose consciousness. I shook him and wet his lips with a couple of drops of Gatorade. If you what, babe? If you... If you squander your precious, beautiful days on meaningless labor, who's... He coughed up blood. Who's ultimate purpose is to further enrich the ruling elite or solidify the hegemony of the state. <clears throat> You're a sucker. His eyes rolled back in his head. I shook him furiously and threw the rest of my Gatorade in his face. But it was too late. He was gone. It was determined at an October 17th meeting, attended by my literary agent, Binky Urban, editor, Peter Gazzardi, publicist, Susan Magrino, and lecture agent, George Greenfield, that I disguise my appearance before entering the Hyatt Self-Surgery Clinic in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Although the dimpled, clean-shaven face framed by blonde-flecked chestnut tresses combed back into an undulating pompadour had become an instant icon to millions of fans who clipped photos from the pages of Rolling Stone, Cream, the New York Times, and the Esbury Park Press and pasted them to dormitory walls and three-ring binders, sometime in early November... A makeup artist was summoned to Team Laner headquarters and instructed to execute a temporary new look. The look was Hezbollah, party of God. Closely cropped black hair, black beard, white button-down shirt, black pants. The Hyatt Self-Surgery Clinic? Self-surgery clinics were the medical equivalent of U-Hauls or rental rug shampoos. Clinics provided a private operating room, instruments, monitoring devices, drugs, and instructional video cassettes for any procedure that could be performed solo under local anesthetic on any part of your anatomy that you could reach easily with both hands. As I pulled into the parking lot of the recently renovated Hyatt, I realized that I'd left my copy of Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen in the Mercury Capri XR2 that I'd test-driven for Gentleman's Quarterly. All my notes 
on the 132-horsepower turbocharged roadster were scrawled in the margins of the Elizabethan poet's magnum opus. I called Casal Lincoln Mercury on my cellular car phone and asked for Joe Casal, showroom manager. My heart went out to Joe, tiny, misshapen, pinhead, flipper-like forearms. Joe Casal. Joe, this is uh, Mark Lehner. I was in about an hour ago to test drive the new Capri, and I think I left a book on the passenger seat. Can you have someone check and see if it's there? No problem, Mr. Lana. Just hold for a couple of seconds. Thanks, babe. A minute or two passed, and Casal returned to the line. Uh, Mr. Lana, I'm sorry, but the Capri you drove is out on the road again. Where are you now? I'm at the Hyatt Regency Self-Surgery Clinic in New Brunswick. I'll tell you what, Mr. Laner. Why don't I drop the book off at the clinic later this evening? It's not out of your way? It's no problem, Mr. Laner. Thanks, babe. I parked, slung my overnight bag over my shoulder, and went in to register. The clerk at the front desk keyed my name and American Express number into the computer. Mr. Laner, what procedure will you be performing on yourself? I hesitated for a moment before responding. It seemed injudicious to divulge to this woman that a deceased rodent was impacted between my prostate gland and urethra and that the surgical procedure I intended to perform was a radical gerbilectomy. Appendectomy. I lied. Mr. Laner, do you have a preference with regard to OR accommodations? Well, where do the real players stay? The real players, sir? I pushed my sunglasses down the bridge of my nose and superciliously eyeballed the desk clerk over the blue mirrored lenses. The players! The Stephen Kings, the Jackie Collinses, the Jeffrey Archers, and Ken Follett's, and James Clavell's. Miss Collins was in last month to remove her own uterine fibroid, and she stayed in... Let me check. Ah, yes, the Tivoli Suite. I would like the Tivoli Suite, then. Very good, sir. It's 10.30 p.m. I'm in the Tivoli Suite and I've just self-administered a spinal block, leaving my lower torso insensible to pain. I'm about to make my first incision when I hear the doorknob turn. I ask, KNS, who is it? With the exception of my instrument tray and lower abdomen, which are illuminated by high-powered halogen lamps, the room is pitch dark. I tilt a lamp toward the door and discern a figure with a tiny head and a copy of Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen tucked under his flipper. Joe? I inquire. It was right on the passenger seat where you left it, Mr. Lena. Thanks, babe. Joe turns to leave. Joe, wait a minute. How'd you like to come work for me? Work for you, Mr. Lena? Yeah. Move into headquarters, coordinate the staff, oversee the bodyguards. You know, do a little of this, a little of that. You'd be my adjutant, my aide de camp. It's a great group of people. You get free medical treatment from Dr. Larry Werther, my cousin, my gastroenterologist. And basically, I think you'd do a great job, and I think you'd have a ball. What do you say? Mr. Lena? I think you have yourself an aide de camp. Joe says, extending a flipper. Welcome aboard, babe. You enter the pink and yellow splashed foyer, and you're swept quickly toward the inner sanctum. Flash bulbs pop as svelte spokesmodel and media liaison baby Lago pours the moet. Out of the corner of your eye, you see Arlene ravaging a French fried yam. She's wearing a short, provocative, strapless dress by Emmanuel Ungaro that's candy box pink and pale green. The dress is so provocative. 
that you want to approach Arlene and perhaps caress the nape of her neck, but you dare not, because there I am. Even more heavily muscled than you'd expected, more frightening, and yet somehow more alluring than you'd imagined. My crisp white shirt is by Georges Marciano and costs about eighty-eight dollars. My suede jeans, Ender Marat, five hundred and fifty dollars, are rolled up. Exposing calves that make you realize, for perhaps the first time in your life, how beautiful the human calf can actually be when it's pumped up almost beyond recognition. I'm being interviewed by a reporter from Allure, the new Condé Nast beauty magazine. I have a way of being noticed and being mysterious at once, like a gazelle that. Is there one second and then disappears? I'm saying. Joe Casal comes running in. Mr. Laner, Mr. Laner, Marla's on twenty twenty. You said I should let you know. Okay, babe. Thanks. Everybody, quiet down. Joe, turn it up. Today, Marla Maples, the twenty-six-year-old model actress who first achieved notoriety as the other woman in the Donald and Ivana Trump divorce, sits on death row at San Quentin as her attorneys exhaust their final appeals in an apparently futile attempt to save the blonde serial killer from the gas chamber. Implicated in the deaths of Leonard Bernstein, Malcolm Forbes. Grace Kelly, Billy Martin, Muppet creator Jim Henson, and reggae singer Peter Tosh, Maples has devoted her final weeks to a letter-writing campaign in support of a congressional bill that will require television sets manufactured after July 1997 to be equipped with a computer chip that provides caption service for the deaf. Marla, you're young, you're leggy, you're busty. Yet in a matter of days, the state of California is going to put you in a metal room and fill it with sodium cyanide gas. Do you have any advice for other leggy, busty young women who might be experiencing peer pressure to experiment with serial killing and who might be watching tonight? That's enough, Joe. Turn the TV off, okay? Thanks, babe. I apologize to the allure reporter. Now, where were we? I was asking you how you got started as a writer, and more specifically, how you got started writing liner notes for albums. When I was six, I came home from school one day, and I went down into the basement to look for a bicycle pump, and I found the dead bodies of my parents. They were each hanging from a noose, naked. All their fingers had been cut off. And arranged in a pentagram under their dangling feet, and in the corner of this pentagram of bloody fingers was a note, and the note said, "Dear Mark, you did this to us." A year later, I took a job as a bookkeeper at an insurance agency that was located in an old two-story brick building not far from here, and on my first day of work, a few of my colleagues took me out to lunch. After a long silence, one of them finally said that there was something very important that they needed to tell me. He said that about thirty or forty years ago, our office building had been owned by a very wealthy man, and this man was a chronic philanderer, and his wife knew about his affairs, and she decided that the only way to end his infidelity and to preserve their marriage was to get pregnant again. To have a change of life baby, so she stopped using contraceptives, and sure enough, she got pregnant. The baby was born, a boy, and he was horribly deformed. He had neurofibromatosis, elephant man's disease. The couple kept the child shackled in a storeroom in the husband's commercial property. He was never brought to the couple's home. But kept for his entire childhood in a dark, windowless storage room in the very building that this insurance company now occupies. 
The child, the monster child, did nothing to stop the husband's philandering. In fact, if anything, the tragedy of this birth, of having to go every day to the storage room and find this chained horror writhing in its own excrement, simply deepened the husband's despair and inflamed his bitter compulsion to betray his wife. All of this finally drove the wife over the edge, and one night, while the husband was working in the office building, she set it on fire. The husband's charred body was found, but somehow the deformity escaped. And although he's never been seen, it's rumored that on his birthday he goes foraging for a special meal of human flesh. At this point, my colleagues looked at me beseechingly and confided their suspicion that the monster child returns at night to the building. We're begging you, they said. Don't stay late. If there's extra work to be done, take it home. But there's danger. We feel it. We feel that he comes back. End of side one.